I have um, Adrian O'Keefe and Sophie Gage with me. Um, Adrian works at the NBA. Sophie works at the NFLPA. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, but the purpose of this panel is to hopefully give anyone in the room who's interested in working with brands an insight into the way brands think about blockchain. Um, these are two organizations who have um, worked within blockchain projects and who are interested in the space. They're both personally interested in the space as well. So, um, oh good, you have mics. Um, I have flashcards. We took questions beforehand on Discord and Twitter, so we'll be actually answering a bunch of questions that hopefully people here ask. So, Adrian, you want to start by introducing yourself? I do. Um, hey everyone, as Katie mentioned, my name is Adrian O'Keefe. I work at the NBA, have been there for six years. Um, I'm part of the Global Partnerships Department um, and responsible for uh, non-apparel licensing, um, which is a fairly broad uh, scope, but our biggest categories are video games, uh, collectibles, trading cards, and run the gamut, uh, toys, basically anything you can think of um, that is not apparel, and I'm now partnered with Dapper, which is great. Yay. You want to give a 101 on YouTube? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sophie Gage. I'm you got to be closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Sophie Gage uh, with NFL Players Association and uh, our commercial arm, NFL Players Inc. So we're the union for uh, the players in the National Football League, and we also have a licensing commercial division which manages their name, image, and likeness rights. So, like Adrian, we have um, you know we license in many different categories from apparel hard lines, um, video games, and now the crypto space. Um, and I've been there for eight years. I think what's inter most interesting to me about this panel is that um, people who have worked in areas of gaming and merchandising and people who understand how to sell things to consumers are really interested in the blockchain space and interested in participating in the blockchain space. So when you're thinking about oh, should we make a partnership with a brand or should we make our own IP or how do we want to think about it? Looking to people that you know who have worked in merchandising who, or who have worked in durable goods could actually be kind of a great path to, to get insights. Okay, let's start with kind of a broad question. Um, Adrian, I'm, I'm going to throw this one to you. Uh, why would a brand want to try emerging technology in the first place? So... It's a good question. I mean, I can't speak for all brands, but at the NBA, I think most of our decisions are centered around improving the fan experience. Um, and we lean on emerging technology to like give our fans new ways um, to basically connect with our game. So whether it's having a brand presence on new emerging social media platforms, the TikToks and Twitches of the world, um, or broadcasting our live games in VR, or you know, leveraging um, machine learning and camera vision through our home court app to give aspiring athletes the opportunity to build their skills. Whatever it is, we're just looking at emerging technology to improve fan experience. And I think Dapper and our blockchain project sort of fits squarely in that space um, since it's going to give consumers the chance to collect, own, trade, um, and really have the moments of the game that mean the most to them. And Sophie, is that kind of the same thing for when you think about the athlete side of it, that there's kind of an interest in um, deepening fan experience, connecting um, athletes with fans directly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the things that we do on behalf of the players is to, you know, find ways for them to further engage with their fans and to get to know them and who they are off the field. And I think, you know, a lot of emerging technology gives fans the opportunity to do that and for players really to interact with them. And I think, you know, on the brand side, it, 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 and really just in categories, I mean, it's a new area for growth. And I think depending on the brand, you know, there could be many different applications, but if you think about things in sports that have been around forever, like trading cards, tapping into these new technologies can really just add new areas of growth, which I think is exciting. Um, and we've been told to be like a thumb's distance away from the mic, otherwise they can't hear us. I'm, I'm really screwing this up. Is this good? Super close. No, even closer. Um, okay, so this one came from Discord. Uh, I don't know if any of you are friendly with Texas Bearcat. Um, how long does 
quote unquote, sports on blockchain exist in one place. For example, does an NBA or NFL PA token last forever or only as long as the license term? So maybe, Sophie, that's a good place to, for you to start. Sure. Uh, I Super think, close. Super close. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Great. Um, it depends. So I think it depends on what type of product that we're looking at in the blockchain space. We've seen some on our side that um, are gearing towards completely decentralized. Once it's out there, it's like a jersey. When you buy it off the shelf, when that deal ends with Nike or Adidas or whoever it is, the consumer doesn't have to go give their jersey back, right? And, and then we've also seen products where it's more of a closed environment where, you know, there's, we see it a lot in the gamification space where, you know, there are limited uses and, and it doesn't just exist out there in eternity. Adrian, you want to weigh in on that for NBA Top Shot? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons that this project appealed to us was the decentralization aspect. Um, as Sophie was saying earlier, you know, I think having consumers and fans actually own these moments um, is what differentiates it and what's going to create a new category for our business. Um, so I think that's something that's really important to us. When we think about it at Dapper Labs, we think about it also um, in terms of what a person owns and what is commercializable. Um, and so when you think about the things that you own, maybe um, you can't print a thousand t-shirts off of your favorite t-shirt. That's not reality. People don't do that. Um, and so in the digital space, maybe you don't have commercialization rights, but you still do actually own the art of the thing that you own. Um, in other cases, like CryptoKitties, we've actually outlined that really clearly where you can commercialize your kitty up to a certain point, and after that point, you just have to come to us for the proper license to be able to commercialize further. Um, but I think setting up those standards is really important in order for us all to actually own the art of the tokens that we own, and we want, we ourselves want to own the art of the tokens we own, so kind of pushing forward to figure out how to structure that is really important. Um, this is a kind of a continuation of the last question, um, and it's citing a blockchain project that didn't appear to actually use blockchain, or it was unclear what chain was used, or it was unclear what standard for the tokens was used. Um, what does that look like for you um, when you are thinking about the technology or you're thinking about someone who comes to you with a project and is maybe in a little bit more of a gray area of decentralization? So it's a good question. I mean, I think at this point in the technology, where the technology is, uh, our view is essentially that, you know, the more we can learn and test and experiment, the better. Um, We've had partners experiment with more closed private blockchains, as you mentioned. They're having some success, but there's obviously sort of a different philosophy and a different approach to the market um, than we're taking with Dapper. I think there's pros and cons to both. Um, and again, just sort of going back to what I was saying before, you know, we see the real appeal of being decentralized and being on a blockchain um, like Ethereum or Flow or any of those is the ability for people to truly own that, and that's what creates that intrinsic value, and having third parties be able to build experiences on top of it. Um, and I think that sort of misses out in the private chain, but um, you know, it's sort of a way for some brands who might be a little bit more reticent to sort of dip a toe. And Sophie, I know that um, on the PA side, you have done kind of a spectrum of different projects. When you look at the way that those projects netted out, are, does, do you have any learnings from it? How do you feel about kind of some of the things that have launched and gone away and some of the new projects that have come in? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's definitely a new space. And closer, of, so well, much closer. One of, <laughs> one of the biggest hurdles that we've seen um, in, especially with brands who try to create their own, you know, they're not adopting um, a, a blockchain that already exists or a token that already exists, they're sort of creating their own hybrid model. And we've seen some hurdles there really in just that I don't think is unusual um, because it's blockchain or because it's technology. It's any new product. You need to get to your consumers and get consumer adoption. And, you know, 
So I think the way that brands can be more effective in doing that and, and reaching out to consumers and explaining it uh, in a simplified way that they don't have the hurdle of, oh, this is something that I don't understand because it's very tech heavy, you know? Um, and so I think it just depends for us on what is the end goal, what are, who are you trying to tap into and what's your product to figure out, okay, do you go with a, a de fully decentralized system? Do you go with um, somewhere in the middle um, or a private? I think that also kind of in that answer for the people in this room who build tools um, is that tools are an essential part of growing this industry. And so for, I mean, at Dapper Labs, we're concerned with kind of bringing mainstream consumers to blockchain technology. And without the tools that a lot of the people in this room are building, um, we won't be able to get NFTs in the hands of mainstream consumers. And so as equally as important as it is to bring kind of giant megaphones to the space. It's also important to have the right infrastructure in order to do that. Um, and without being asked, I'll also answer that question. Um, so I'm sure that the person had a recent execution with Panini, the trading card brand in mind while they were doing this. And when I see stuff like that, I'm super excited about it, regardless of where it sits on the fully decentralized scale, because if people don't try stuff, then there won't be learnings from it, there won't be um, content in the ecosystem to continue to engage people. So maybe it wasn't as decentralized as we would have done it, but the fact that a really traditional trading card company like Panini is interested enough in the space to launch a project under a banner of blockchain, I think is positive for all of us. Um, the kind of eyeballs that that gets and the normalizing of the language that we use around our products is gonna be really important. And I also, um, one thing I'd add to that is sort of what Sophie was saying about it's who your consumer is and who you're trying to reach. Panini has a very, if that's the brand we're talking about, Panini has a very specific consumer, the people who are hardcore collectors and aren't necessarily gonna go through the, the hurdles, so it makes sense for them. Yep, cool. Okay, we got another one from Twitter. Um, this one is, what are common misconceptions brands have about utilizing blockchain technology? Um, I, another way to phrase this, I think, uh, could be, what are kind of the biggest points of discomfort about blockchain technology? And maybe I'll ask the lawyer first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, this is a relatively new space for us. And I think one of the biggest areas, especially where we're positioned, um, you know, we represent the interests of the players, the athletes, and how their rights are used out in the marketplace. And so one of the big areas that we really had to wrap our minds around and get comfortable with is, you know, not unlike jerseys or a physical product that you put out in the market, um, but in that you're never going to get it back. But I think the difference is that when you build on top of that in, in marketplaces and infrastructures, different things can happen, right? And so part of it for us was, okay, how do we navigate through this space to make sure that we're protecting our players and our IP? Um, but at the same time, embracing this exciting growth in this new category. Um, and I think the other thing, and not to fully nerd out on you guys on a legal standpoint, is just the uncertainty that comes with, are these securities, are these utility tokens, which is, you know, again, it's a real, it's a very real concern, and the SEC hasn't given a whole ton of guidance on it. And so a lot of it is a learn, is it learning experience, and we sort of, you know, take what we know and, um, and, and try to put that into practice as we're rolling out new product lines in this space. You want to talk about the SEC at all? No? I agree. <laughs> um, I think that is a real concern, though, not just for big brands entering the space, but for all of us as we're thinking about um, what is our, even personally, what is your NFT income mean for your taxes? What does that mean for your organizations? What happens when you move money out of crypto into fiat if you're paying your employees in fiat currency? So, so many, um, so many complexities around there that just haven't been sorted out yet. Um, okay, and then one last one, and then maybe we'll take a question from the crowd. Um, what should blockchain companies know as they try to connect with brands? Whoever wants to take that first. 
Well, I'll say, selfishly say for our space, um, I think that if you want to connect with brands in sports um, or consumers that are fans of sports, you know, there are ways that you can tap into the athletes and the influencers and the brand power to really push out a very new product and to make consumers more comfortable with it. And so I'd say, you know, don't recreate, recreate the wheel. Try to use some of the same strategies that traditional products and brands have used to, to create buzz um, and simplify it down to not scare people away. But, I, you know, I think athletes and the, the star power of sports leagues and teams and brands can really be helpful with strategic partnerships. Yeah, and I would just build on that because I completely agree. We met with um, dozens of companies in the space, um, you know, as we were sort of exploring and learning. And I think one of the things where companies would most frequently fall down is they would come to us with capabilities rather than products. Um, and which is great, but to Sophie's point of like not reinventing the wheel, um, you know, what resonates with us is products and how we can engage with our fans and how we can sort of drive a new area of our business. So I think that's what's really compelling versus just the underlying technology. Yeah, and having also worked on the league side and the TV broadcaster side before blockchain, um, I would be pitched social media tools, digital tools, um, digital experiences that didn't start with the fan and those were the easiest ones to just say that's not for us it's it's about what do you bring a consumer and i think probably almost everyone if not everyone in this room holds some kind of nft um, and think about your experience and the experience you want to have with those things um, and that's that's at, at least for us where we start and i, I would encourage other people to start there as well um, so we got a question from Andy Boyan in the audience. Uh, for both of you, is there any discussion about who owns player data and how that can be leveraged as IP? For example, a team or player with data about their shot percentages in practice could use that to give insider info for fantasy sports. Or are you just talking about collectibles? I think the root of this question is, are you looking at blockchain from just an NFT perspective or from other use cases? Yeah, I mean, I'll touch on it from my perspective on data. It's absolutely a hot topic right now, not just in football, but in all sports. Um, and in terms of player data, ship, data ownership, um, we treat the NFLPA uh, and players and athletes at large view it like they do their name, image, and likeness rights, right? So if you want to incorporate a, an athlete's name on your product, you need to get those rights either from the athlete or the union that controls them or the property that controls them. And so data is the same way. Now, um, there's a, that's the very high level answer. Um, there are a lot of um, intricacies if you peel the layers of the onion back. Um, about where is it collected? Are we talking about biometric data or are we talking about statistical data from the games? But um, generally, we treat it just like we would any other uh, IP for players. I mean, I don't have much to add to that. I think RPA would echo that opinion. Um, you know, I think is to your latter sort of interpretation of that is are we thinking of it from other areas or just from collectibles? Um, you know, I think we have a team internally at the NBA looking at various ways that blockchain can impact our business, not just collectibles. That was just the way that made the most sense um, to sort of get started. But we're looking at it across the board. Great to meet you. Great talk. Um, do you have any experiences you could share? Like, um, did you play college athletics or any athletics or maybe experience trading cards as a kid that made you want to work on these projects? Um, so I did, my brother collected trading cards growing up. Uh, I was an athlete growing up and played uh, a college sport. Um, ended up getting into sports through an internship that I had at Nike during business school and um, it's been great. And I sort of have a background in technology. My first job was from in Forrester Research. Um, and that foundation combined with the video game aspect of my business sort of just all converged. Um, into the blockchain project. Adrian's being coy. She also holds several different kinds of currencies and also has a bunch of NFTs. So 
she both is mired in the sports space and in our space. Do you, did you want to answer how you got into sports and how the technology connection, and then we're going to get kicked off? Yeah, sure. Um, grew up playing sports, played through college, um, was, you know, a fan of many sports, not just football. Um, and yeah, that sort of intersected me um, to this space. I mean, sports is such a huge market. I'm a lawyer by trade um, and have a business background as well. So it was just a natural intersection for me. Um, and it's been great. Cool. We'll be hanging out. So come and say hi. Hi.